had the idea to do an exploration trip here in northern Saskatchewan and into the Northwest Territories in the fall after the entire lodge has basically shut down. There's a phenomenon that happens every year for a week in September where lake trout come from the depths of, you know, anywhere from 60 to 200 feet deep. And they come up on the reefs staging to spawn. They change their colors from silver, fire red, orange, spots. They're aggressive, they're angry. Got him, oh, it's a giant. In a week's worth of fishing on fly, I release six trophy fish. That is a fish of a lifetime, an absolute fish of a lifetime. We're at Scott Lake Lodge in Northern Saskatchewan and the beaver is loaded for adventure. It's unlike any place I've fished before. The people are fantastic and the fishing is on fire. Hey everybody, Mark Melnick here, welcoming you to the first of our rekindled broadcasts of live, Lodge Lo Lodges Live. It's, uh, it's exciting to be back. It's a lot of fun and uh, I'm really excited to introduce in a minute, Jason Hamilton from Scott Lake Lodge. But before we do, check this out. Scott Lake Lodge is a beautiful destination for fishing, but more importantly, it's a culture that we've created here. It's a culture of fun, friendship, people coming together for five days a year that they look forward to the other 360 and spending time with people that they've gotten to know because they come every year and exploring nine million acres of the northern wilderness, catching some fish, making some memories. So we're chasing northern pike, lake trout, an Arctic grayling, and we are lucky enough to have them all in larger than average sizes and larger than normal quantities. Now, everybody's staying in a standalone cabin. It's a pine paneled cabin. Each one is themed after a particular northern animal or the aurora. Uh, they're well appointed private washrooms, and then we do all our dinners and breakfasts up at the main lodge. It's a beautiful building on the Esker overlooking the lake. The best time to come here is whenever you can get a spot. We've got a great following with our returning guests. So whenever you can get a spot, there's gonna be great fishing, great meals, personalized customer service, and you're gonna have a blast. The guide staff is a special group. They're a little unruly at times, but they've been here average of 17 years guiding at Scott Lake. And most of them been guiding for over two decades. So they'll make sure you're catching fish, having fun. They're great communicators and are able to tailor any trip to which you'd like to have. You're sure to have a blast with them. The fall program here is something that we've been at, trying to add to more and more. It's not always great weather. It's not always the greatest fishing for quantity, but it is a spectacular time of year. Often we see Northern lights overhead and the fishing can be absolutely spectacular for lake trout in very shallow water. You can catch them in one, two feet of water, sometimes sight casting to them. Pike are fat, and we have had some great times fishing grayling. So we want to share that with more people, and we're finding more and more people that are willing to make this trip in September to enjoy it. You know, one of the things that is, um... That brings me the biggest smile to my face in seeing that video is the section about the guides and the guide staff at Scott Lake Lodge are second to none. They're tight friends. They speak together. They hang out together all season long. Um, and it shows when you go to the lodge. But there's a reason why those guys are like that. There's a reason why the most junior guide, I believe, has been there for 17 years. And it's because of this man. Jason Hamilton, the manager at Scott Lake Lodge. Jason, you run a unbelievable ship that is, uh, that you know, it's a lodge that can be rivaled by no one 
around the world. It's it's absolutely fantastic. That's I uh, appreciate it, Mark. I mean, that's extremely high praise. I certainly can't take all the credit. We've got uh, a fantastic ownership group up there that has been willing to invest and reinvest in a culture um, with the with the staff and the guides in particular to keep them there and professional development, you know, trips to different parts of the world to go fly fishing, to learn their craft of guiding, to improve it. And it's been awesome just to be along for the ride. Um, we've, we've have one gentleman up there uh, hitting his 30th year of guiding at Scott Lake this year. And he's thinking about retirement, but he's been thinking about it for a number of years now. And uh, <laughs> or he's our head guide one of the best fishermen I've ever been around in the world. And uh, one of the guys that can catch fish on the gloomiest and most miserable days that, uh, that you come across, but he's always out there pulling a couple big ones. How long, how long have you been with the lodge, Jason? Uh, this will be 13 years for me, 12, 13 years. Uh, started out as a guide and um, had a transition in the office with the, with the management and uh, they put me in the office to see how it would go. And so far it's been a, a fun ride, learning lots and uh, really enjoying, you know, the, the different challenges in the office as opposed to finding fish. It's finding, finding planes and fuel and food and all that fun stuff. Well, tell me a little bit about the location of Scott Lake Lodge, because I, I was fortunate enough to be there with you in the fall of September last year. Uh, not this past September, but the September before when you were basically closed down for, for because of the pandemic. Um, and we went on a, an exploratory adventure. Now, whereabouts are you and how do people manage to get to where you are? I mean, you're, you're not, you know, a hop, skip and a jump away, a jump away. No, uh, you know, we certainly are a, a good bit of travel for most folks. Um, we're located right on the 60th parallel. The lodge itself sits on an island about um, 500, 600 meters south of the Northwest Territory border into Saskatchewan. Half the lake is in the territories, half the lake is in Saskatchewan. So we fish Scott Lake itself and a couple other attached lakes, Wigness and Premier, um, and then fly to about 24 other lakes in Saskatchewan and the territories. Um, pe people would catch a flight up to Edmonton, Alberta, and from there, we run a, a Dash 8 charter in normal operations. Um, and that's about a two-hour flight. You get on in a private uh, hangar. You land in Stony Rapids, Saskatchewan. And then we get you down to the float, ba uh, float base, hop on an otter or a beaver, take a 50-mile uh, trip into Scott Lake. takes you about 20 minutes. And... Um, you know, pre-pandemic, we used to be able to get people from most parts of the lower 48 states to Scott Lake all in one day. You know, obviously travel has slowed down a little bit, some changes there, but we're, we're expecting some great announcements in, in actually the next two weeks about some more direct flights from the U.S. and Canada into Edmonton. So we're thrilled about that and anxiously awaiting final word to, to get people up there a little quicker. So what's the capacity of the lodge? I mean, you've, you're, it's, you're north. So your seasons are not, well, they're, they're growing because you're focusing on shoulder seasons, pre-regular season and post-regular season. So what, what exactly are your seasons at the Lodge? Well, we start out uh, June 9th every year, the same calendar days. And typically we would, uh, you know, been ending right around that 1st of September in the past. Um, but what we've been really trying to do is spend time up there when the lake trout are up shallow, like you had a chance to see. It's just an incredible time of year. Now, the weather can be colder. It can be beautiful. Um, but the chance at catching big lake trout, even medium-sized lake trout on a fly rod, just in a couple feet of water is incredible. Uh, we've been going right through to about September 15th here. Uh, last year was the 16th, and one of the best, weather weeks of the whole season was that last week and it was absolutely amazing to be able to see people in shorts casting for trout when the water temperature is in the low 40s high 30s it just was really neat you know what? let's let's come back to the fall program in a little bit let's let's move let's take a step back i jumped ahead of uh, ahead of myself here um and let's let's cover a little bit more about the actual physical lodge i mean you're you're on an island in the middle of scott lake there's nine million acres that surround you two million acres of fishable water 
Tell me about the infrastructure of the lodge. What people can expect is: are you are you in rustic cabins? Are you are you like five diamond? What's what can people expect when they when they land that beaver or otter at the dock? They can expect to be greeted by a bunch of people that are genuinely happy to see them. Um, you just don't stay in this business for a long time without having that level of excitement to make some memories with your friends and, and new people that you're meeting. the The lodge is a small city. We have uh, 30 staff and 26 guests that are at a given time. It's a little village, um, you know, about half the size of the village I live near here in Northeast Saskatchewan. Uh, we have to have all the different uh, power plants and plumbing and all that good stuff to make sure the people are comfortable. The cabins, we've been renovating those steady over the last decade. We have them at a spot now. We're just thrilled with how they look. Individual cabins, uh, two anglers to a cabin, private washroom, most have a nice deck. Most have all been redone in the last couple of years during COVID. And um, it's got all the amenities of home that you need, a nice propane fireplace, some chairs or a couch to kick back and have a drink and look out at the lake. Um, breakfast and dinner is up at the main lodge, and that didn't miss any renovations. We redid the bar up there. It turned out we had uh, a need for more bar capacity in the evening, so we lengthened it by about 20 feet added a whole new section on the lodge and that's kind of the the heartbeat of the place that's where the fish stories are shared and where you just make these friendships you know the the staff is on display up there and they're encouraged and love to interact with the guests they're not you know back in the staff quarters after the day of guiding you know we want lifelong friendships and relationships built up there and it seems like uh you know, that's where it all happens at the, at the main lodge. Yeah. And, and, and you say it's a small city, but it's, you know, it's, it, it's very cozy is the right word. I mean, when you've got, when you've got your own private cabin, um, you can, you can have your meals at the lodge or at your cabin. I mean, it's, it's an absolutely fantastic facility that, that caters to whatever level that you're looking for, for social activity, or if you just want to be, want to be on your own. Um, let's talk a little bit about the um, the seasons of Scott Lake Lodge. I love the north, northern Saskatchewan, primarily in the springtime because you have the ability to sight cast for northern pike. Let's take a little look at this video and then we can react to that afterwards. Take a look at this. It's coming for the white streamer. Here it comes. Fast, fast. Bang. That's so cool, sight fishing for pike. Because on this light bottom, they stick out like little dark olive logs. And you can just watch the, that pike, as soon as the fly hit the water, it just turned towards the splash. And as I stripped the fly towards it, it just let it go by and then just turned onto it, followed, I stripped, I paused. Sight fishing at any time is cool. And in these shallow, calm back bays, they're great escape. If you've got some inclement weather because they're protected, especially using either very, you know, white in this case or black flies that you can easily see in the water. Because sometimes all you see is the fly disappear. I'll let you release them, Mike. Now the season, the season for for anglers up at Scott Lake Lodge, you said it begins early June. When typically is the ice out? And talk to me a little bit about the pike's um, patterns as soon as those that ice is out, as it relates to sight fishing. Yeah, the the, uh, the ice out is typically right around the first of June, within a plus minus three three four days. Uh, that's the long term average that that we've found in. That finds the pike really looking for a differential in water temperature. They are looking for water that is warmer by a few degrees only. I mean, we could be talking uh, one, two degrees, you know, at, at that point in the spring that would really drive where fish are. And, you know, 
the north side of the lake, south facing bay, especially if they have a little darker bottom where a creek is coming in and things like that. That's where we find the fish basking in the sun. You know, they'll, they'll go down and feed on burbot, cisco, maybe other pike and lake trout, and then go up and get in that warmer water, speed up the metabolism so they can digest and get, you know, back to feeding to recover from the spawn. You know, the spawn it ha usually happens mid-May up there, third week of May. Um, so what happens is we have a lot of fish in the shallows. They're just getting back on the feeding program. They're hungry and you've got to trick them because often they have full bellies. And what happens is we throw bait fish flies at them. We, th we throw, um, you know, rabbit strip leeches at them, all sorts of different things. But th the first week or 10 days, you can have some of your best luck fishing uh, a real, real small rabbit leech, you know, like an inch and a half. And it's kind of the, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't eat just one more piece of dessert, uh, their stuff, but that little thing going by them is enough to trigger them. So that's something that we've had a lot of luck with. And, um, you know, the, the rabbit leech is a classic for, for springtime pike on a floating line. Uh, but that, that micro leech, I think, is, is something that's getting more and more traction with our customers and guides. Now, the water's still too cold for top water at that time. Is that correct? Or, or if, can you, you, can, can you, you can find, find spots? It. You know, if you, have a, if you have a couple of warm days in a row, you can certainly do top water. Um, I, I think the smaller fish, maybe, you know, generally males are more liable to come up on top earlier then the, the bigger fish um you've got to see the water temperature getting a little higher kind of into that 50s mid 50s range before you're, you're going to start to see uh, some bigger fish committing on top in a, in a meaningful way you get a lot of followers as the water's cold and, and have to fish a little slower so i think that's more conducive to a subsurface fly hey jason we have a we have a question here from andy andy johnson from bc do you have to rent a cabin as I don't have extra money? Could I pitch a tent on the property? Unfortunately, no. Um, we, we have the same number of anglers as, as we do cabins. And uh, it's not a huge island. It's only about 12 acres in, in size. And we have, uh, like as I mentioned, two anglers per cabin. And, and that's what we sort of found that works well to fill the float planes and the charter plane. You know, and looking at the at the lay of the island, you know, you've you've got cabins on all the habitable areas of the island. The, the backside of the island is actually quite quite uh, hilly and treacherous as well. So you've yeah. you've populated the island very well with with the cabins that you do have. Um, moving along to other species in the springtime, what are the lake trout doing at that time? And something that's a big interest to me is uh, what's your Arctic grayling fishery like in the spring? The, the springtime grayling fishing is, is um, a little tougher, to be honest with you. What we're dealing with at that point is sort of the freshet, the, the runoff in all these rivers. and High water, right? Yeah. What, what happens frequently, there's such small rivers between, between the lakes. Uh, it's just the fish are in the willows at that point. You know, it's tough to find a place to stand and fish. Uh, we typically wait till a little later in June, you know, second, third week of June to to really get after the the grayling. And it just improves as the water drops and the rivers warm up. Um, not seeing the dry fly bites early June. Definitely, you know, definitely seeing a, a nymph program with them. Sort of that, uh, you know, a, a couple prince nips or copper johns is what's making that happen and, and honestly often what we're doing is fishing our toes you know you find a place that you can get a, a roll cast out five feet even and keep that line off the water and the, the slack off and you're catching grayling just off your feet because the high water has pushed them right into the right you know the bushes at that point um the lake trout is a oh it's 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 amazing and frustrating at the same time because they could literally be anywhere in the lake they could be 150 feet down some some fish or they could be in 18 inches of water in a pike bay um what we see right at the start of the season is lake trout on sand they're relating to big shallow sand flats um you know near drop-offs and then moving off to the drop-offs as we transition into the second third week of june there are some really cool opportunities if you're willing to be patient 
and have your guide cruise the edge of these sharp sand flats on the edge of an esker because you can actually sight cast a cruising lake trout and it's a you know a really neat deal um often they're not huge when you we get them doing that we do get some real big lake trout in pike bays whatever reason i don't know what the answer is there but first you know the first two weeks of the season first two and a half weeks of the season you get some eight 10, 15, 20 pound trout in two, three feet of water. And they're just in there to feed. And it's often one big fish by itself or two, you know, two together about the same size. That's fascinating. Um, so moving on to the summer program, uh, Northern Pike assumingly are moving a little bit deeper or does the water stay cold enough that you still have access to, to Northerns that will come up into these dark body or dark bottom bays uh, on sunny days adjacent to deeper drop-offs. What's, what's the pipe yeah. program at that point? You know, when we think of our summer, we're, we're typically thinking um, late, late June through or early August. And we start start to uh, see the fish certainly dropping off as weed growth comes up. We we're starting to fish a little bit of eelgrass and cabbage and milfoil that's growing up. Um, we're able to get really good consistent sight fishing on Scott and the flyout lakes and, until mid July. Um, you know, and that's all weather dependent. If it cools down and it rains and blows for two days, and that's going to reset things. You know two days of sun will we'll have a temp temperature differential between main lake and the bays and we'll see fish pack up. Um, if, if it's hot for seven days in a row, hot and calm, those fish are going to drop out of the shallow bays and, and, you know, be seeking cooler water. Uh, well, here, here's a, here's a great example, Jason, of, of what happened with Phil when he was there sort of late spring, early summer. Check this out. After a few hours on the water, it soon became apparent that targeting pike in shallow bays adjacent to main lake structure, such as rocky points, drop-offs, and nearby islands, was a wise idea. Pike prowled the main lake structure, hunting for all manner of food, including lake whitefish, burbot, even each other. With the hunt complete, the pike withdrew to the shallow bays, where the warmer water temperatures helped them digest while they rested before hunting again. Despite their often full bellies, it seemed the pike always had room for more food. These staging pike chased our flies at times with reckless abandon. During our trip, we also learned that not all bays were equal. Although almost every bay held fish, water temperature was key. Pike resting in cooler bays were often reluctant to chase the fly. Warmer bays, with water temperatures in excess of 60 degrees Fahrenheit, always produced. <laughs> now it's upset <laughs> that's upset clear the decks clear the decks i don't want to be standing on the fly line use my pinky guide that spare line up okay keep tight keep now i'm tight to it and i might stick them a couple more times get the side pressure on them Ooh, look at the dust clouds he looks bigger I'm going to pull this anchor up so we don't have that issue. Right in the side of the mouth, 36, 37. See if I can steer them in. So there goes to show that, you know, even even if the bays are warmer, you know, those fish, those fish will come up chasing food and, and uh, you have an opportunity to target them in the shallows in the summertime, too. Yeah. And you know what? A, a real cool bonus thing. And I I'm jumping the gun here, but I assume we're transitioning into fall here at some point. But um, the pike, after a couple warm days, you can get that same sight fishing in September as you do in June, because you, you have that colder main lake and, and the chance of a, a warmer, you know, a warmer back bay. And we had some incredibly fun action this year, 
last week of the season, mid September with Pike and two feet of water. And, you know, just, it, it, it's not what you, you think of when you're thinking about sight fishing Pike up North. So. Well, it, you know, and, and I can speak from experience too, because when I was fishing in the fall, fishing those, those shallow water lake trout, we went into the a place called the Bay of Pigs, which is just a, you know, a four or five foot deep, basically vast weed bed, the size of multiple football fields. And, uh, it was hot and it was, it was calm, mm. glass calm. And Mike Demian thought I was nuts. And I put on a salty Jack, which is a, which is a tube fly that has a, that has a, a hook that actually you tie your leader to that comes out the back end. It's not hooked up here. And we had dozens of pike over 40 inches that would come skyrocketing out of the water for that in the fall time. So that was, that was a pretty, pretty special event. But before we get into the fall, let's go back to the summertime and talk about the grayling fishing in, in, in the rivers come summertime. And, you know, I love grayling and catching them on humpies. That's really the time to do it or, or stimulators. That's really the time. To do it, it is. It, it, it's just a, a beautiful time. We certainly see more insect life coming, coming alive in the summer. The waters drop. You can read the rivers a little, you know, more easily. Uh, really target them behind rocks and some just fun little slick runs. You can get as technical with it as you want to. You know, a lot of the times they're pretty eager and um, willing participants, but, you know, you can make a challenge out of it by fish, you know, fishing them as you would a spooky trout and a lot of fun. I really enjoy yeah. it. And they get quite large. I mean, a trophy's 19, right? So yeah, we, yeah. we get, um, we don't get a whole lot of grayling uh, over 21 inches, you, you know, in that 21 and a half, 22 is about our, our top end that we've found, but we do get a lot 18 to 18 to 19. A um, yeah. lot of fun. Hey, Jason, here's a question from Brent. I know that, you know, on the flyout program, which we'll talk about in a little bit, guides are mandatory because you're taking a, a float plane into a, into a remote lake and there's, engines need to be assembled and boats need to be flipped and all that kind of stuff. But what about Scott Lake proper? Are guides mandatory on Scott Lake? Yeah, we, everybody's going out with the guide. And, and one of the big reasons for it is Scott Lake and more Scott than many of the other flyout lakes is an extremely rocky lake. It's very dynamic habitat. And the guides are spending a lot of time running their boats in two, three feet of water. Um, just the experience being able to navigate that safely is paramount for us. You know, we have had guys that have been there 25 years hit rocks. Um, there'll always be some of those, some of those mishaps, but I, I think that um, going with the guide is, is going to be the safest way to navigate these giant lakes and the surest way to have success when you get there. Yeah. Let's take a look at, let's take a little bit of a look at some of the guides at Scott Lake Lodge. Despite its remote location, just a few miles below the Northwest Territories border, near the 60th parallel, some 555 miles north of Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, getting to Scott Lake Lodge is pretty straightforward. After arriving in Saskatoon, I boarded our Transwest Air regional flight for the short trip from the Saskatoon International Airport to Stony Rapids. Within two hours, I was standing at the dock ready to board my float plane for the final leg of our journey. Less than 30 minutes later, I had arrived at Scott Lake Lodge. I couldn't wait to get on the water. Prior to my trip, I visited the Scott Lake Lodge website to gain a measure of what I might expect. When checking out their guide team, one particular caption caught my attention. Many are called, few are chosen. It's not easy being a Scott Lake Lodge guide, as they need guides who can do more than just find fish. Their guides have to be competent navigators. After all, learning over a million acres of water isn't easy. They also have to be accomplished wilderness cooks, entertaining communicators, comfortable using complex GPS sounders, infinitely patient, and of course, be fun to be with. The average experience of their guide team is nothing short of impressive. I considered myself extremely fortunate to have the benefit of fishing with three guides during my stay. Mike Nugs Demian, 
Paul Pollywood Hamilton and Greg Hammerham. I knew I was in good hands, as together these guides have a staggering 41 years of combined guiding experience at Scott Lake Lodge alone. This was going to be a great trip. It was a great trip. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, Phil, Phil was also a, a visitor during the pandemic as well. So he came up through Sa Saskatoon. You know, typically we, we run a charter plane uh, up and Phil had to uh, had to do a, a number of fuel stops along the way. So we we treated him to the finest uh, small airports in the north. <laughs> Sure, and he's fine. He, he, he's fine with that. Um, let's move on to the fall program, and this is this is the one that's nearest and dearest to my heart because I've actually experienced it. Now, the 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 fall program for lake trout doesn't mean you're only fishing lake trout. You've got access to uh, lakers, whitefish, um, grayling, and ample northern pike on not only Scott Lake proper but all over that 9 million acres of land that you have access to. Now, give us a, a little bit of a preview or give us an overview of what the, the fall program was when I was there and what it's turned into now after yet another, another season under your belt. Yeah, it, you know, we, we hadn't been up there. We'd been up there building uh, for a number of years in the fall where we're doing these renovations. As you can imagine, the, the season to do any sort of construction work is, is fairly short. So we were up there in September, we would catch a few lake trout around the lodge. We wouldn't do a whole lot of fishing. Um, what it was when you were there was a concentrated effort on, on trying to find in pattern, larger fish. You know, we knew we could go out and catch lots of fish in that, you know, two to 10 pound range. There was going to be a lot of opportunity for that. But what we really wanted to see is, what the timing, what the water temperature was, the calendar dates were going to be for these larger fish coming up on these shallow reefs, staging to spawn. Um, we did some great record keeping when you when you were up, Mark, and and we did last year, and we were kind of putting together a bit of a water temp and and uh, calendar date program. That I think you know that first week of September, you're starting to see it. The second week of September is certainly um, much more prevalent, and you know right up until about the 15th, 17th it is just prime time for big trout shallow. Um, I, th I think the time that the big fish spend shallow is, is not great. Um, and I think you've got to be putting in your time to be up there in that last two weeks to, to get them. And your chances are uh, greater as September moves along. And then we just get into weather that's a little too dicey to, to run a safe operation. Uh, the, the pike are the fattest they're going to be in the year. They've recovered from the spawn. They've fed all spring, summer, and fall. And they've put on, in a lot of cases, six, seven, eight, ten pounds for a big yeah. fish. Yeah. They're fat. They're looking to eat and feed. And it's just a blast. You know, we're fishing them on rocks a lot. We're fishing them on windy shorelines. Certainly weeds, cabbage weeds are so important in the fall program for pike. But they really do start to move to a lot of main, rake, main lake rock structure. Um, kind of think about fishing muskie on a, a Canadian Shield lake and where they would be in September. And we're seeing a lot of similarities in our, in our pike fishing program. Right. I think you had a chance to catch some of the white fish uh, that we have on Scott. And that, that's a lot of fun. It's a great add in on a four weight, you know, we're catching them on, on nymphs um, often white fish up to eight, nine pounds, which is just a blast on a small uh, light setup. And yeah. they're darn good when they're smoked up. And uh, we've been really enjoying that. The grayling, I think it's the best time of year to be a grayling fisherman up North. The leaves are changing all the biting insects are gone from the rivers and the grayling are still hungry and coming up and smashing dry flies. Yeah, I it was the, it was the absolute best. It was fantastic. I think there's a clip in the video. You just see these the grayling come right up out of the water, you know, breaching yeah. to, to come and eat the dries. It's, I think it's the absolute best time to go chase grayling. Jason, what is the camp record for trip for Lakers on the fly? Uh, camp record for Lakers on the fly. Good question. Um, 
it would be in that 42 and a half, 43 inch range on, on the fly. Um, I, I could be I'm sorry to someone if I'm missing one that's bigger. Um, the, you know, the camp record for lake trout on conventional gears is up around 48 inches, 47 and, and change. And, uh, we certainly, you know, did get a few over, over 40 inches the last two falls, um, on the fly we try not to weigh them and just quick measurement in the water and and, and get them back uh on their way one of the cool things at scott lake lodge is this uh, i think it's called the centennial program is that what it's called where if you get oh. you reach a hundred inches with the three yeah the three big species so pike um grayling and lake trout if you if you reach a hundred inches you become a centurion and you get a, you get a Scott Lake Lodge vest and there's a whole bunch of pomp and circumstance of, about it. When I was there, I was half an inch shy. I was oh, no way. and a half inches total on <laughs> all those trophies. But to, that to say, you know, in five or seven days of fishing, I released six trophy fish like that on fly. That's, that's absolutely remarkable. We, we, we did have some conditions to contend with when you were up there as well. They, we didn't have easy, easy fly casting conditions every day. Um, we, we, it doesn't happen every week. Uh, it's not an easy mark to hit on, on all three, you know, real big fish. You know, you've got to have uh, that 45 inch pike, 40, you know, 40 plus inch lake trout and, and a real nice size grayling as well um, to qualify for that. And, but we, we do have a lot of fun with it. And I think the lodge record was set this year at 111 and a half inches wow. by one of our anglers, Mark, uh, Mark from Chicago area. He's been up with us a lot and is a heck of an angler and he really got on all the right fish this year. Well, here's, here's an example of one of the big Lakers you can catch on fly here at Scott Lake Lodge. There he is. Oh, good fish. That's a big one. This is a giant fish. Mike. Yes, sir. This is a northern pike, right? <laughs> <laughs> you looked at it, I didn't. Oh my gosh. Oh, are you kidding me? Okay, well, that's... It's pulling the boat. Well, that's good, we're in the rocks. It's a lake trout. It's a big lake trout. It's not a northern at all. A big lake trout? It's a big laker. Well, there was a, always a chance to get a big laker in the front. So it's a big laker. <laughs> it's a big laker? Yeah. All right. Wow. We'll take your head out of the water if you can. Just, yeah, slow. That's yeah. Sweet. That's, that's why that. you've got those big nets. That's right. Clearly. <laughs> that's awesome. Wow. What a fish. Nice fish. So she rolls. Big laker. That's about 37 inches. 37. Excellent fish. What isn't told is that that fish took probably close to 20 minutes to bring boat side. Like it was, that was, that was with a nine weight and it was nothing but pure power. It was fantastic. You know, a, a nine weight is just on, I think, you know, we're finding that we're looking at 10 weights a lot more for, for fishing the, the larger size Lakers in that shallow water. They just seem to go so far, you know, they'll go off the edge of the reef or the ledge that they're on and then just sound and take a pile of line with you. You really need some, some power to be able to turn them. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, here's another question from Andy. Um, is it all fly fishing setups? Could you fish from a shoreline using dead baits or drifting alive or suspended under a float? Uh, we, we don't do any live or, or dead baits up there. Um, we do fish conventional tackle and fly rods. So when our guides leave the dock, they'll have a setup that includes you know, two or three fly rods and a, a half dozen or, or more um, spinning, casting and trolling rigs. Uh, for the for the trout, we, you know, we'd fish spinners and soft plastics when they're up shallow and, and pike as well. That's a, a pretty common bait for both, uh, you know, but we are seeing more and more fly anglers and it's just a, a spot where there's agreeable fish. You don't have to be able to cast super far for people to learn and we're seeing more and more people asking the guides to, 
you know, hey, I'd like to, you know, see what this fly fishing is all about. Let's maybe take a half hour and kind of learn to throw 20 feet, 30 feet, and then, then go uh, catch a smaller pike and get into it. Music to my ears. Here's a, here's a question from Pierre. I don't have a fast connection. Send me some information on the costs and connections to make. Do you have to have the COVID shots to go up there? I already have had COVID. Yeah, the, all the... All the info is at scottlakelodge.com. It's um, it's all there. You know, if you scroll across the uh, info bars at the top, you're going to see a schedule and pricing tab. That's going to give you all the information about what it costs to get there, how you get there, what's included, and which you know what you need to bring. There's a lot of great info on the site. Um, you know, Tom Klein, one of our owners, uh, is a publisher. He's a great writer, and he has put together uh, just really interesting and engaging um information on on scott lake um you don't need anything special anymore to come up to scott lake lodge there's no covid restrictions on the island and on any of our flights so we're you know going to be cautious with uh, anyone showing symptoms obviously but we're not going to restrict uh restrict anybody so you've got a small window in September where this fall program is going to go off. And the, and the window, I mean, it's not like a week. It's, it's, it's a span of a couple of weeks where you can, you can tie in. Um, but the northern pike fishing there is fantastic from ice out to freeze up. Um, you know, we had one back in that bay where I just re released that Laker. We had another one show, another big fish show up. Let's take a quick look at that. With one final morning left here at Scott Lake Lodge, Mike and I decide we'd hit the water in search of one more fantastic fish. It took some time, but our efforts were rewarded. Well, what was that? That was huge, whatever it was. We'll go catch it. You come around and have a look at it or flashed at it? Yeah, I flashed on it. That is clear, a line, clear line, clear line. I think it's a big pike. Yeah, it's a big pike. Yeah, it's a good pike. Good, good job. One. Well, not trophy size, but it's all right. Wouldn't that have anyway? I want to have a look at him. Oh, that's bigger than I thought. Yeah. Nice. Good fish. Real nice fish. That's a beauty. That's a good one. There she goes. How thick it is across the back, eh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's an awesome, right. awesome fish. What a great way to go exploring here at Scott Lake Lodge. All right, let's get her back in the water. Good work, man. Next fish. It always amazes me when the guide's got a bigger smile than the sport. <laughs> you don't, I think you've got to get a lot of catching done in your early years to be a great guide. You've, you've got to get a little bit of that, uh, I need to catch every every fish that uh, that we see out of your system, and we just have you know just certain folks never get over it. Um, Tom, one of the owners, is not a great guy because he wants to catch every fish in the lake. <laughs> one thing before we go, before we get into the equipment, anyway, is is one of the important things that we that we try to speak of as fly anglers and um, and conservationists of our of our sport is I'd like to listen to what Scott Lake Lodge has on in place for conservation of all three species. Um, you know, what, what, what are you doing to look after the, look after the fisheries? As much as we can. And we're trying to learn and improve every year on it. Um, you know, it's obviously changed over the, over the history of the lodge from it started off in the late sixties as a proposed commercial fishery. And, had moved into a sport fishery, obviously in the, the 70s, 80s, lots of catch and keep. Uh, we're, we're strictly catch and release. We do keep some smaller fish uh, for shore lunch. We're all barbless hooks uh, on flies and, and, you know, conventional tackle as well. And we try and employ the big nets that you, you showed there, the big kahunas, that the fish could rest in the water and recover, you know, as, as more and more research is coming out in that, that sort of keep them wet movement. Um, we're seeing that any time the fish is out of the water for 30 seconds or more, the, the chance of a, you know, a negative sport fishing mortality reaction goes higher and higher. And 
we're really trying to promote the the anglers to limit the amount of photos that we're taking of fish. You know, we have a lot of returning anglers, about 75, 80% of the people have been there before. They've caught some nice fish with us and trying to encourage them to think about the fish and the fishery. And, you know, let's get a f- photo of you releasing the fish as opposed to another grip and grin of a, a nice 40 inch pike. Um, really trying to, to make that, make that move where we're trying to promote the photos of the fish in the water. And I, I know that's something that we're going to see, you know, in more fly fishing publications as we go, you know, on and on. Um, another great thing that we've been doing, we, we're fortunate enough to have access to this just amazing amount of water and many, many lakes. We're cycling through the lakes. And that means a lake that we're going to fish in 2023 might not be a lake that we're going to fish in 24 or 25 and I think one of the lakes that you fished, Mark, we, we flipped the boat over for the first time in five or six years. Um, that's huge in being able to, even it's a small amount of pressure relatively compared to some, you know, more Southern and, and uh, popular fisheries. We don't want to handle those fish every week, every year for, you know, many times. And we want to give them the chance to rest, to grow, to pass on the big fish genetics so we can see the the fishery at Scott continue to improve. Um, we've kept really good records of our pike over 40 inches and in our, in our big lake trout. Uh, what we're seeing right now is the, the number of pike over 40 inches, which is kind of the benchmark for a bigger pike. Um, that's increased since 2017, since we really started this fisheries management plan of cycling through the lakes. So what we have in 2019 and then in 2023, the last two years of operation, the largest total of big pike caught in our lodges history of keeping records, which is about 26, 27 years at this point. So we're really proud of that. It means, you know, that we're doing something, something right. We're allowing the big fish to go back you know, our catch and release handling methods are improving and we're seeing more and more of those big fish. And that is everything in this industry. You know, that's one of the things I noticed for sure was when I was fishing with Mike and, and G-Man for that matter, you know, the, the fish were not even touched. You know, we're, we're fishing all barbless hooks. Um, you know, here's, here's a, here's a casualty of Scott Lake Lodge to be honest with you, like, look at, look at the way that that hook is bent out, right? That's, that's from a lake trout. But as you can see, those barbs are all pinched down, right? So what happens is those fish come in, guide grabs, grabs the, um, the fly at, at the, at the eye of the hook and it's gone. And the fish doesn't even feel its own weight of gra- under gravity. So I think it's a, it's a fantastic program. The fact that you can go up there and catch six trophies in a week is, is, speaks volumes to to the conservation method now one other thing that we need to talk to before i let you go and i know you probably have to go to the bathroom but we need to cover off the equipment that people need to bring um for for these these species so if you want to go ahead um and talk about uh northern pike and lake trout and then we'll switch over to gray sure um the the great news for people that are worried about having to pack a bunch of stuff and travel up to scott lake is you don't need to bring anything Um, the, we've got tons of flies on the wall. We've got all the line leader tip and material up there. Your guide is going to have it all. Um, we're going to have Orvis Helios, uh, rods in the boat for Lake Trout and Pike, you know, nine, 10 weights, and then some, uh, some other Orvis rods for, for grailing up there. Um, we do see, you know, nine weight is about, as I mentioned, the average for, for Pike and Trout. Uh, if you're throwing bigger flies and if you're if you're really targeting some bigger fish, the 10 weight is uh, is the way to go. Um, the early season for both species is going to be a floating line. Um, most oftentimes we're going to have a second rod rigged up with a sink tip or an intermediate sink uh, in case we start fishing on a you know a windy shoreline if the fish aren't up shallow. And then, you know, as, as we get into the later season, August, early September for the, the pike, you know, we're throwing intermediate and sink uh, and full sinking lines to get down, you know, into the weeds at that six to 12 foot range. Um, 
certainly in the fall, we, we like our, our lake trout program with the intermediate lines. It just lets you keep the fly down in the strike zone and stripping fast because the lake trout are so quick and they want to follow the dart and they'll take swipes at it. And if you're blowing that fly up out of the water all the time, you're going to miss a lot more, a lot more fishing opportunities. Grayling, grayling, we're doing a lot of that with uh, four and five weight rods, um, you know, floating line most often. We, we really rarely have to put a sinking or a sink tip line on, um, you know, the odd time, maybe a split shot just to keep it lined up in, in the current on a nymphing rig. Uh, what, what I am kind of excited about is playing around with a three weight little trout spay rod and uh, some small streamers for grayling. We've had a few uh, a few good takes on that, and that's a lot of fun um, in some of the rivers, you know, the bigger rivers that we fish uh, further north. Amazing. That sounds like a lot of fun too. So one other thing, we're going to go through some of the flies that, that, that you should consider uh, bringing if you want to bring your own flies up to Scott Lake Lodge. Um, for lake trout, um, any kind of clouser minnow works amazing, um, weighted or not. Um, it, it all depends on, on what, what your, what your, your line weight is, but one of the flies that we found, um, that I have found that has been the most successful is a fly called the whistler. Now I've got whistlers in chartreuse, in orange, orange and black. Um, that's all I've got here. But what's interesting about a whistler is if you look carefully at the, at the eyes, the bead chain eyes, you can see that they actually have holes on both sides. So when you're pulling that fly through the water, it actually creates a little jet trail of bubbles that attracts that that's, it's a visual attraction for like trout and, and Northerns to be honest with you that come flying in. So this is a weighted fly, barbless, um, not hard to cast on a, on an eight or a nine weight at all for Northerns. Um, I, you, uh, Jason, you mentioned burbot fly or burbot as one of their one of their main sources as well as whitefish. So you know we've got burbot patterns, black over orange, lots of flash. Same with um, uh, the whitefish patterns because these big pike will eat whitefish. And of course, you can never ever discount a top water like a salty jack. So and and you know what? Even if you want, bring along an old sailfish fly. You know big giant, you know, throw it on a 10 weight and, and see what you can do. They, they're protein hungry. They are opportunistic and they will eat. I, I imagine men will eat pretty much anything. Well, what was your, what was your best color mark for, uh, for Pike when you were up there? I'm just I always like to know. That burbot fly. Burbot fly. Okay. Yeah. That purple, burbot fly. Purple and black is, has been my go-to for a number, a number of years, similar sort of fly. Right, and on the top uh, for top water, this uh, this orange salty jack and the chartreuse salty jack was was unbeatable. I mean, I like coming straight out of the water after it. It was it was heart stopping, just heart stopping. All right, Jason, is there anything else that we need to cover? Um, I think it's important to say that if anybody is looking on social and wants to learn more about. Fishing in Saskatchewan at Fish and Hunt Saskatchewan and um, the hashtag Fish, Fish Sask and Hunt Sask will get you to everywhere you want to be. Uh, for more information on Scott Lake Lodge, you can see that at scottlakelodge.com. I would highly recommend if somebody's looking for a trip of a lifetime, we haven't talked about the food, um, but it goes without saying it's some of the best in the industry. Um, it is a absolute gem of a place to travel for couples for families or for just a couple of fishing buddies anything else you'd like to add jason it you know we're always trying to improve every year we're looking for things to do at scott lake and we listen to our guests and we listen to you know tourism sask and, and media like new fly fisher that comes up so we love to hear the feedback about how we can do things just a little bit better we're willing to reinvest in the place and make it towards the goal of the best fly and fishing experience in North America. That's our goal. We're never going to get there because it's always going to be something to do with the next year. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you folks and, and thank you guys so much for including me on this and coming up and we look forward to doing it again um, with a, another crew to share, share that memory with. Yeah, that's great. We're going to be up in the, in uh, the summer, spring, summer of 2023 shooting another episode with, 
uh, Alex Parks and her dad, Jeff Parks. So we're looking forward to that. And for anybody that wants to see past episodes from Scott Lake Lodge, there are all the extended play versions are on our YouTube channel. Uh, so check it out there. You'll be glad you did. For everybody here at the new Fly Fisher, thank you for watching. My name is Mark Melnick on behalf of Jason Hamilton. Remember, adventure is out there. All you need to do is go and find it. And one better way than to do it with a fly rod in your hand. For all of us at the show, all of us at the show thanks for watching. We'll see you again soon. Thank you.